In this lecture I'll be talking about product and service measurement. The aim is to understand why we measure, appreciate that measurement systems may not exist for you to use directly, and understand measurement systems. So hopefully if you need to, you can create your own. So we'll be going through purpose and principles, some systems, and then I'll leave you with some seminar points you can go through on your own. We begin by challenging the need for metrics by asking the question, why do we measure? Why do you think we need to measure our operations and processes? Well, the saying goes, you cannot improve what you cannot measure. How would you know that you've improved something if you haven't got a measurement before and afterwards? It becomes apparent that performance measurement systems or assessment tools are required to help control and monitor the various products and service processes that you might have. That's particularly during change activity when you may be challenged upon your achievements. How do you show that what you've done has made any difference? So the purpose of performance metrics is to assess the degree of improvement that occurs as a result of change and to provide a structured approach to allow performance to be visualised and quantified. So measurement systems may not be well developed for your use. Lean organisations use simple and well-designed performance measurements to provide operational and financial control to motivate people towards lean behaviours, to direct and initiate continuous improvement and provide a focus for decision making and management direction. So what we see here is the continuous improvement cycle. So we start off at the top there with specifying value from the customer's perspective. What we mean by that is we really look at what the customer actually values, not what we think they value, we ask them. Once we've understood what that is, we can then align our processes to deliver upon that value. We can then establish metrics to measure and sustain that process. Then we go back and we ask again, are we delivering to customer value? Customer value is dynamic, so we've got to keep going through this continuous improvement cycle. Now, the implementation of performance measurements long been established in product manufacturing. But the same cannot be said for the performance measuring measurement systems in service. Broadly speaking, we find measures fall into three types. Static measures are gathered only after an event has occurred, therefore they're lagging indicators, they happen after the event. It is in general impossible to make corrective actions before knowing the outcome, uh, because you know these are reporting on events that have happened, so you can't correct for them uh, and change that outcome. Most financial measures actually belong to this category. They're results-focused measures, such as return on investment, profitability, etc. But they've, they're reported after the fact, sometimes up to a year after the fact. Uh, from a business perspective, they're quite meaningful. They show you what's been going on, but they, they're really acting as a scorecard for managerial decisions and the formulation of strategies to show you how well you did. Dynamic measures have feedback as a goal and they're leading indicators that help you predict probable outcomes, work in progress, and therefore help you make corrective actions. Uh, it's action focused, it's clear uh, and can be used to halt, slow or accelerate processes as needed. The benefit is it's predictive, therefore extra resource can be applied early to correct errors rather than late in a project cycle, which usually tends to be more cost effective. The third category is motivational measures. This is uh, one of the, the more poorly understood or, and less widely implemented in the business world. It's essential to translate business objectives into meaningful and motivating measures uh, to enhance performance. Employee motivation can only be cultivated when there's confidence in performance measurement systems. So really you want systems to be of high accuracy and integrity. I mean, typically you'll still see that the motivational metric is pay and they'll give you targets to hit and often you'll find uh, in your own experience that the target you've been asked to hit you have absolutely no control over uh, the business or, or its ability to meet that target. 
So have you got examples of measures you have experienced and which category is it in? Quality is a key driver for measurement and it's not a new concept. Walter Stewart published the world's first book on quality control, Economic Control of Quality of Manufactured Product, back in 1931. Uh, Edward Deming invented the Plan D Check Act quality improvement cycle. Uh, Joseph Duran emphasised the identification of customer needs. In the 50s, the application of quality control was extended to functions other than manufacturing. If you look at engineering, sales and marketing. And Crosby promoted the concept of right first time in the 60s as a means to change management culture in organisations. Two major studies have explored world-class and ideal measurement. Characteristics of world-class measurement uh, was provided by Maskell. Now, if you look there, he provides a direct relationship to manufacturing strategy. Non-financial measures are incorporated, different measurements of different areas of a company. Simple, easy to use and provide fast feedback. The measures change over time. The measures are aimed at fostering improvement rather than simply monitoring. Now, Mayo in 2002 looked at what, what would be ideal performance measurement. Well, he spoke about parsimony, the fewer the better. He looked for predictive ability, the leading and lagging performance indicators. He wanted pervasiveness that were motivating and enhancing improvement. Stability, he didn't want them changing, and the applicability to compensation. Now, if we look at those, we can see that many of them are in direct contrast. You know, they're almost opposing uh, each other between what's world-class and what's ideal. There are a few similarities. Continuous improvement plays an important role in performance measurement though. We've got to keep underpinning that. Whilst we strive for continuous improvement, the rate of change does not always have to be dramatic. Along the journey of continuous improvement, it's not unusual for the rate of improvement to vary. Now, this is uh, well depicted by Schoenberger's Plateau of Quality Improvement. Now, Schoenberger here so it shows, you know, we, we go through a period of high change, rapid improvement. We then fine tune for a while. We have our plateau and then we re reorganize people and, and that change becomes a way of life. It is actually quite important to have that plateau so that things can bed in. So... What are performance measurement systems? Performance measurement can be defined as the process of quantifying the efficiency and effectiveness of action. A performance measure is defined as the metric used to quantify the efficiency or effectiveness of an action. A performance measurement system can be defined as the set of metrics used to quantify both the efficiency and effectiveness of actions. Effectiveness the authors refer it to the extent to which customer requirements are met. And efficiency is the measure of how economically a customer's resources are used to provide a certain level of customer satisfaction. The purposes of performance measures are presented by Mayer. He identifies seven different uh, purposes. So we might have roll up or cascade down measures. So those are measures that we, we keep adding together and, and they combine to, to make a high level metric or they might be cascaded down from the top. So a very high level measure is then split apart to create local actions. We might have comparative measures. So comparing one activity to another. We'll have leading indicators that help us look ahead and we'll have lagging indicators that look back to how we did. We'll have motivational measures, and we'll have compensation measures. Crosby suggested four absolutes of quality management linked to measurement. He said quality is defined as conformance to requirements, not as goodness. The system of quality is not appraisal, but prevention, prevention of defects, and the performance standard should be zero defects. The measurement of quality is the price of non-conformance and not some indices. He also came with, came up with this DERFT, which is do it right first time. 
So now let's look at measurement systems. Financial performance measurement systems should be familiar to all. So measurement systems for setting targets and controlling performance by various measurements is common practice in accounting. Traditional performance measures are employed to show financial performance, such as return on capital employed, earnings, before, uh, earnings per share, earnings before interest and tax. These are classic financial performance measures. Generally, financial accounting measures are regarded as outcome oriented or results focused. Uh, they define the business uh, measurement in terms of monetary resource equivalents uh, and they're usually for external use for, such as financial reporting and auditing. They're not so much used for sort of shop floor processes. Financial measures are limiting and may at worst be misleading. Uh, most financial measures, it's fair to say, are lagging because they come after you've built something and you've sold it. And that's when you see how much money you've made. They also implicitly assume that the lessons learned from studying the past can be applied to the current or even to predict the future. So if we consider the FTSE 100, 100 index, is that a leading or a lagging indicator? And what does it tell us? What do you think about that? To overcome inadequacies in financial metrics, Kaplan and Norton developed the balance scorecard. Other than financial measures, the balance scorecard includes operational measures from three perspectives, the customer satisfaction, internal processes, and organizations, innovation and improvement activities. As an approach, it's believed to offer the following benefits. Translating the enterprise vision to help managers build a consensus of opinion about goals and missions, communicating and linking strategies to allow cohesion between functional and individual objectives, planning the business from different perspectives, providing feedback and learning to help managers direct the organization. However, whilst you'll hear lots of good things about Balanced Scorecard, it is criticised in relation to the ability to actually apply it. In practice, it's very difficult to apply Balanced Scorecard. Finding the right non-financial measures and using these in combination is very difficult. Mayer argues that the Balanced Scorecard provided no guidance about combining measures. It was intended to communicate strategy rather than to measure and compensate performance. Uh, Andy Neely also criticised the four perspectives of the scorecard as just being too simplistic. So Mayer promotes uh, an activity-based measurement system similar to activity-based costing. Activity-based profitability analysis takes activity as one of the basic elements of the firm. It's claimed to act as a powerful tool for measuring and improving performance if the activities, their costs and revenues are understood. The four basic elements of a firm are said to be its activities, its cost, its customers and its revenues. So as the customer is the profit center, activity should be designed to maximize the value delivered to the customer, which in turn drives revenue and increases profitability. Therefore, the, the heart of the activity based profitability analysis is to assess activity costs, compare that with revenues in order to decide which activities are valuable or wasteful. So it's got uh, elements of lean in there and classic activity based costing. Now Cross and Lynch report a pyramid based approach developed in Wang Laboratories. Uh, it's called Strategic Measurement and Reporting Technique SMART. Now, they're saying that an effective performance measurement system allows corporate vision to be translated into business objectives. Vision is translated into business function, uh, objectives according to market needs, uh, which flows down to customer satisfaction, which flows down to quality delivery cycle times and waste and, and all the way down to operations. So measurements uh, reported upward, progress is refu reviewed, the objectives are obviously translated downward from this great corporate vision and it's claimed strategies and performance measures are linked and well communicated. If you do that you'll end up with this smart measurement system. I'm pretty uncomfortable with that. It's very top down. It provides masses of layers between the corporate vision and operations which are seen to be somewhere at the bottom. Um, I think that's a terrible way to run an organisation. 
The performance prism is a framework which addresses the organization's relationship with all of its stakeholders. It's got five facets. The top and bot bottom facets of the prism are stakeholder satisfaction and stakeholder contribution. That's interesting. So it's showing your, your stakeholders contribute to the firm and that also links to their satisfaction. Then the three sides around the edge are your strategies, your capabilities and your processes. So this looks at satisfying both stakeholders needs and the contribution that the stakeholders offer. Now problems will still arise in the correct selection of metrics, but I think this is a much better structure to consider. Now SASA looked at the concept of service and constructed a metric framework around their view of business. So within their service concept, they split it into service design which is defined by management and service delivery which is delivered by operations so on the design side you've got all the facilities the goods that you provide explicit services defining what they are implicit services those additional things which are required for you to deliver the service you proffered the process design and the standards you set now in the operations side you're looking at the performance of the machines the tools the people the quality of the environment, the speed of the delivery. And this together creates your service level. You set expectations and perceptions, satisfaction, dissatisfaction, and you are here judged by the customer. This is the parasermal, Sithmal and Berry uh, model, which looks at gaps between expectation and perception in performance. I've got a whole separate video to explain this in much more detail. Uh, fundamentally, they identify five gaps between expectation and perception. So uh, the first one here looks at the management's perceptions of what the customer wants and then actually what the customer expects. Then we have, there's a gap between what the manager perceived and how they're able to translate that into actual service quality specifications. Then there's another gap created between those maybe written or trained uh, expectations, perceptions, and what's actually delivered um, at the service stage. Then there's a gap between what we're delivering and what external com communications, maybe marketing is telling customers. And then finally, probably the most important gap is the gap between what the customer expects and what they perceive they receive. Now this is a great model. You can use it in many different uh, assignments. Uh, you can measure any of those gaps through often through interviews or surveys and then you can embed it in this literature. It's also a great model to remember uh, for use in exams when you're struggling a little bit. This is a great piece of theory you can employ. This is a nice little model uh, by uh, Arun Ung that looks at the inseparability of partners in business to business services. It's a conceptual model. And fundamentally, it looks at a value co-creation uh, between a service interaction between uh, two different parties. Um, so we have parties A and B, and we have the co-creation of value between them. Uh, this is a function of the activities of both parties and give rise to the benefit B for the customer and revenue P for the firm. Uh, the benefit B has dependency on, upon value propositions and so has this modifier theta in it. So basically what those curves are showing you is depending on how much contribution either party puts in, towards value co-creation, you either create more or less value. So this is a set of measures that I developed whilst working with a large aerospace client. It consists of five uh, sets of measurements. The first set in the center there, these are operational metrics that apply to the production process throughput times, changeover times, uh, similar metrics to those. The second set of metrics you can see falls into two different categories. There are interdependent measures and independent measures. Now what we noticed 
was that, for instance, when we're delivering to client, frequently we measure goods delivered at the point of uh, finished goods, which is here. So we say, well, those goods are finished goods for the client. And we measure them at the factory gate, not at the point the client receives them. So we change that. So now we measure goods delivered at the client site, not at the factory site. But we also start to measure the interdependency between the two. Because what we were finding was that some clients <coughs> would place an order for something saying this is urgent and yet it had a 30 day lead time and they wanted it in 14 days. Or sometimes during production there might be a question sent to the client and they wouldn't respond and then they'd be saying well where's our parts and they said well we asked you a question you didn't respond for three or four days so they're going to be three or four days late and the client's getting really upset. So if what we did was put these metrics in and made them visible to everybody. We did a similar thing at the back end there where we've got the, the suppliers to us and again we have uh, goods arriving to us as the measurement but also when did we order these things what's our communication this interdependency same again with our internal suppliers and to our governance function so these are multiple sets of measures that really provide open and transparency and I thought uh, a little bit more honesty in the whole process. From an enterprise level we could show many sets of metrics. Uh, the overview for the, the service showing the interdependent and independent measures and this was our high level view that we shared with the corporate. Here's some actual measures taken from different companies we worked with. So uh, these are delivery schedule achievement. So that's the number of planned deliveries. Take away uh, the number of deliveries outside the customer's delivery window added to the number of partial deliveries divided by the number of planned deliveries. So customer reject rate is the quantity of agreed and accepted rejects over the total quantity of units delivered. Reject rate is the quantity of defective units divided by the total quantity of units applied times uh, 10 to the 6. So that gives you uh, the number of defects in parts per million. So value added in per employee is the output value. Take away the input value divided by the number of employees. Stock turns, well this is quite common, it's the sales turnover divided by the value of raw material added to the work in progress value of that added to the value of finished goods. One important thing to remember is temporality time impacts measurement. What impact does when you measure have on measurement? So that's a really important question to consider when you measure has such great importance on what the outcome is of your measurement system. So the phenomenological value experience is not restricted to linear time. What does that mean? Well, the way we perceive and experience things isn't necessarily linear. If you're hungry and you're waiting for food, that seems to take a much longer time than if you've just eaten and something's not coming, you're not that bothered. So really recognizing that how people perceive something is hugely important. We draw on past, present and future experience when we make an assessment. So sense making uses the hermeneutic spiral where current experience is always based on previous experiences. I had a great example of this from the head of British Airways, Willie Walsh. And he said, look, I'd rather all our planes left a minute or two late than one plane leaves half an hour early and the next plane leaves five minutes late because we set an expectation. We must always try and deliver a service that people can rely on. So it's reliable customer journeys as opposed to some early, some late, all the same is much better. 
So practices or routinized behaviors repeated over time, it doesn't mean they go on forever or they won't change. Just because you have something that's going really well, things can change, things can upset you, particularly contextual changes can impact on your processes. So you've really got to keep those quality measures in place. Practice changes when they become inadequate or challenged or, con or contested because practice is contextual and dynamic. People get into routines that they're comfortable with and when you try and change those things, often you'll find that people push back. So that ends this particular lecture. Please do see the other videos in the quality series. There's also a specific paraceremonal uh, serve qual model video that I've made to really explain that in a lot more detail. So do have a look at that. Thank you very much.